This week, we're going to talk about what we val in the shadows, a large scale study of eval in our programs. This was work that appeared at Oopsa 2021 by Averal Goel and al. The context of this work is the R project, and they describe themselves as a free software environment for statistical computing and graphics. The deal is that R is an important language, and yet it's unexplored by programming languages researchers. There's kind of this phenomenon where you have languages that don't come from PL and then people don't really pay attention to it. Um, PHP is perhaps a terrible language, but it's another example of that, that situation. Instead, R was designed by statisticians and not programming languages researchers, and they designed it for data science. And so there was an R community survey and it's been running for a few years. And so most people, the first computer language that they, they learn if they're programming in R is R, and then it's Excel. And then only then after that is like C and C++ with like 14%. All right, so why are we doing this? The motivation is that we are programming languages people and we want to, of course, do static analysis and optimization of R. There's a lot of code that runs under R and it would be really great if that code ran faster, right? And that's what programming languages research can do. But there's this bogeyman eval and it's gonna come get your kids or something. Anyway, eval, it's big and scary. So what does eval do? Eval lets you evaluate um, some code and you execute it. Of course, that's what you're doing when programming anyway, but the issue here is that the code that you're generating with eval is constructed at runtime. And so what that means is that it is hard to say what that code will do in advance. I guess about 10 years ago, Gregor Richards, who is um, also at Waterloo, um, wrote a paper with um, his advisor at the time, Jan Vitek and others, the eval that men do, a large scale study of the use of eval in JavaScript applications. And you can vote on which hat he wears, although since we're remote, you won't really see that hat anytime soon. The approach in this work is dynamic analysis. And so what we do here is we run the code and we see what happens, maybe a bit faster than these people running. Contrast this to static analysis, where you look at a dead code um, that's just lying on the ground and you're seeing what's going on there. So dynamic analysis, you're looking at live things that are going on. Static analysis, you're just looking at the code. All right, so let's talk about why eval happens in R. So the R designers are not opera designers, but let's pretend they are. So what they said is we don't want macros, right? No macros here. And like then language or library writers say, okay, fine, we'll use eval. And so what eval is used for in R, and we'll see this in this work, the results that we have here, is that it's used for metaprogramming as well as domain specific languages. It's widely used it performs side effects, and it reaches many environments. So these are the things that we'll be seeing. So about R as a programming language, it's definitely a programming language, and it's kind of designed to be difficult to reason about at some level. And so it's lazy, vectorized, and functional. Um, and so here we have this function called R gamma, and it has things that look like environments, but it turn that look like parameters, like three and two, and um, 10 long, but it turns out that these are actually only evaluated lazily inside the function R gamma. And not only that, but they're, of course, they come with an environment in which they get evaluated. So everything's a function call. So R gamma clearly looks like a function call, but even things like if they're function calls too. So this is call by need and function parameters, as I said, are promises. So they're some code and they come with some environment. All right, so eval is a function in R and eval comes with three parameters. It comes with an expression to evaluate, an environment, which is where the expression can cause havoc. And so that's particularly interesting. And that's in fact why eval in R is worse than corresponding things in Java or JavaScript. Um, so Java is still pretty dynamic, but it's not nearly as bad as eval in R. And um, ENCL is an enclosure with bonus variable bindings for expression. So if 
environment doesn't have enough stuff, then you can pull in more things from Enclosure. And you can also change that. Great. Okay, so let's talk about this paper. It's for the most part. So we'll talk about the methodology and the corpus. And then they have a lot of experiments. And we'll talk about these experiments, like the frequency of eval, what it does, and the usage, like why people do eval. So first, let's talk about methodology. So there's three sources for their corpus. The R base library, which is fairly small, but it's you know really fundamental because it's the base. And then there's CRAN, which has a lot of packages. And so they have 15,000 packages from CRAN with 4.66 million lines of code. This includes tests, examples, and vignettes. And then they tried this. It didn't work out that well, but it was good to, to look at. And so they downloaded end user scripts. So CRAN is by library writers. They're experienced R programmers for the most part. Then Kaggle is just people using R, right? So they downloaded 7.9 thousand scripts with 665,000 lines of code. So it's still a reasonable code base. And they found it had 74 evals. So it's like, well, we tried it, didn't work great. Sometimes it's good to put some negative results in the paper, um, although you won't usually get a paper in with just negative results most of the time. All right, so the pipeline of their work, it's actually fully automated in terms of generating all the graphs from their data. So they have something that downloads packages, and so they download the packages, and then they extracted programs from the packages and made them runnable in their context. And then they ran it, they ran each program. So 49 million eval calls in their thing with uh, 14 million side effects. That took 36 hours. And then they analyzed the results programmatically. So they have 2.8 million unique eval calls, 22% of packages use eval. Docker is kind of terrible in some ways, but it's, it does ensure an environment that's standardized. So they did parallelize this a lot. They ran it on a lot of computers in 36 hours, and all the computers had the same environment. And as I said, the graphs are generated from the data automatically, which I will complain about when I get to a graph. Um, we'll see how, we, how I find that somehow unsatisfactory sometimes. Okay, so there's a dynamic analysis and things are always harder than look. So conceptually, it's quite simple. You have an R virtual machine, and you instrument it to capture what's going on. So they have R din trace, which is an extended R virtual machine. With um, It's an R module, and uh, it has 3,000 lines of C++ code and 1,000 lines of R code. And they talk about various technically uninteresting challenges, which are useful for reproducibility. They also make an artifact available. So they get most calls, but they don't get all of them. They miss 0.09% of calls, and they're like, well, we think it's not important. I agree. It's probably not. There's nothing special about these calls, and there's already enough in the calls that they do get that that's good. Okay, so we talked about the methodology. Let's now talk about the results. So the first part of the results is how often does eval happen? Are there a lot of evals? And so before we talk about that, let's distinguish between the static notion of a site, which is you have the source code, and this is one line of code which contains eval. And then the dynamic thing, which is a call. So you run your code, and you get an observed invocation of eval during a run. So that's dynamic. OK, so basic frequency stats. These are pretty easy to capture once you have your machinery. And they're slightly interesting. They're good to have. So out of 3,500 packages and 38,000 sites, 22% of packages use up eval. And so that's not actually a lot, but it's enough. It's like a hell of a lot if you're trying to write a compiler, right? If you're writing your compiler and, well, um, one in five packages don't work, then that's not great. Of these 22% of eval using packages, only half of them have less than three sites. So they use eval, but they don't use eval that much. And all but one packages have. Um, less than 800 sites. There is an exception, VGAM, which has 2,300 eval sites. So that's the package level. At the function level, 2.5% of all functions use eval. Because we're talking about code coverage, I thought I would mention this. And so how well are we measuring what we measure? Well, we're limited by the test coverage. Our code on CRAN in particular has a lot of tests. And so that's helpful. But the overall code coverage is 51.7%. And the runs exercise 52.9% of sites. So 
we don't see what every eval does, far from it, but we do see enough eval sites to know some good evidence about what happens with eval. And we know that um, basically 90% of packages have less than three sites, right? So that is useful information. They have this graph. They said coverage is uneven. Sometimes their explanations are not ideal and I really didn't understand it. So I'm, look, if you were presenting this and you came up with this, then you should not talk about it uh, because I'm presenting it. I should say, look, hey, I read this paper. Sometimes there's things I don't understand. The, um, the explanation in the paper is really incomplete and I will admit that I don't understand it. Okay, so another thing about the frequency analysis that they're doing is, well, where are these calls to eval happening? And so you, one thing is it might happen in a loop or it might happen in initialization code. And so as I said, I complain a bit about their automatically generated figures and tables. And so here's one. It's not, I guess, the fact it's automatically generated that's a problem. It's the fact that they didn't give it a good name. And so here we have this table and they entitled it normalized calls. But what it really is, is distribution of sites per call. And so what we can read from this table, sometimes I even put the thing that you read from the table in the table caption. It's, I think, not a bad idea. Anyway, out of all the calls, um, a lot of the um, calls have a lot of, the number of calls, um, the number of sites, sorry, that has zero to 50 calls is 16,000. So of the static evals in the code, most of them occur from zero to 50 times at runtime. I think I might've also pulled out the number of zero. Zero to 50 is a large range. Um, sure, it's not that large, but zero is a different, different number and I might pull it out. The numbers that are above 50 though are quite small. And so most of these sites are called not very often and some are called a lot, like 2000 times. Um, okay, the next thing is how big is the expression that you're evaluating? So we talked about how often eval happens. Now we're talking about what the parameters are that eval is getting. And so one of the things that eval gets is a expression to evaluate. There's a long tail, it's truncated here, but most of the eval expressions, like you know, over 30 million of them are, um, one node, right? And so the vast majority of them are, are really quite small, but there are some exceptions which we've truncated here and they're quite large. Um, if you wanna know about them, read the paper. All right, the other question is how much work happens in the evals, right? And so this is a violin plot. And so what we can see here is that almost all evals don't do much work. So the previous one was statically, how big is the piece of code that's being generated? This one is, okay, you have the code that's being generated. Does it contain a loop basically, or does it contain a large computation? And most of the time the answer is no. 90% of evals execute less than 90%, uh, less than 50 instructions in the R virtual machine. There are some that are quite large. And so there's again, this long tail of um, outlier evals. Okay. So let's talk about the counts of evals. So one thing I like about this paper is that it actually has pretty good discussion. And so last week we had this paper and had discussions and I was like, eh, these discussions are not that great. This time the discussions are really quite on point. And I think that's the strongest point of this paper. So eval occurs in a substantial minority of CRAN packages, mostly as the discussion says, in statistical modeling and simulations packages. Because we evaluated whether it occurs in loops or not, we can say mostly it's used for configuration metaprogramming as in not in loops. And most evals evaluate some tiny amount of code, but some are huge. All right, moving on to the next session, what is eval for? We're gonna look at four things here. Uh, I've reordered them. I thought this order might be a bit better. Although, um, yeah, let's talk about that as we continue. Although it's also the case that you wanna put the most important thing first because people pay less attention to the things that are later. So what does expression look like? Where does it come from? So I thought those were related. So that's why I put them next to each other. Then what is the environment? So where can eval do its havoc? And 
what side effects does it do? So does it do havoc and what is it doing to change the state of the program? All right, so first of all, what does expression look like? And so they did this analysis of the shapes of expression. So you have all the expressions, they capture all the expressions, well, almost all of them, and then they glob them into things that look, look the same. So they get rid of constants and they kind of take the most important thing. Um, so some of these things include other things, but they, they call them something. And so the five expression shapes are variable lookup, function calls, both nested and non-nested, values, and lookup and dollar value, vector indexing. Um, these all execute quickly and the information for that is not shown. So here we have variable lookup. So we have y plus one, it's represented schematically as x, and that accounts for 27% of expressions. And so that's really quite harmless. It's just a read, right? Nothing bad is happening. The next one is actually significantly worse because we have a nested function call. Um, the function call itself is fine, but it might do something and we don't know what. So nested function calls. And so that's represented as f of f of x. Then we have values. So c of something is a vector value that's being created in R. Then we have function calls that are non-nested. So now we're down to 12%. And so we can see there's a lot of function calls. They actually account for like 33%, but most of them are nested as it turns out. Then we have lookups and dollar vector indexing, which if you knew R, then you'd know what that is. I don't really know R, so we won't really talk about it. So as I mentioned in the introduction video, there's a notion of polymorphism versus monomorphism. And so here, what they do is they investigate of each site, site, how many shapes does it do? So like we have this eval, but is it actually going to execute differently on different runs through the program? Most sites see just one shape, so that's almost 90%. Um, but that's most. And then JavaScript was the overwhelming, overwhelming majority. So 98% saw just one shape. And so R has a fatter tail. Um, they said 7,000 sites see one simple shape and 600 see multiple simple shapes. So in somewhere else in the paper, they say how many sites there are, but they didn't do that right there. And that, that was annoying. So again, numbers without context, not the best. So each of these simple shapes, you could think about replacing them by get assign or do.call. All right, so the next thing that I'm going to talk about is where does expression come from? And so it's like, how do you get an expression to give to eval? And so they have this uh, origin graph thing that they have. And so you have an eval, and because you're running dynamically, you're like, well, where do the things that make the eval come from? And so they basically take left-hand sides. And for this example, the origin is parse, and then you have a quote, which you set to the um, to the thing that you're, you're, you're changing then you evaluate it. But the main thing that's going on is parse here. So you parse this A semicolon B expression. So the origins are as follows. 45% um, are reflection. So they take something in the invoking expression and they reinterpret it. So you call your function foo and you have some stuff going on in the invocation. So it's going to transform somehow the invocation. It's, it's metaprogramming. Then 24% is string things like the parse we saw before, or string to lang, or string to expression. Then there's 17% which are constructed, so things like quote, expression, and then uh, some of them come from the environment and some of them come from external, but not really very many. All right, so let's talk about more about the discussion. So usually it's from match.call or substitute, and sometimes strings. And so as I said before, this is basically metaprogramming. And so the authors wrote, some uses could be replaced by macros if the R designers could be convinced to overcome their distaste for those, right? So you can't get rid of all eval with macros, but there's a fair amount that you could, is the, the um, opinion of the authors. All right, so which environment does eval play in? And so where is it causing havoc? So in 70% of cases, it's doing something to the environment of some function on the call stack, right? Sometimes the program is calling new.n to get a synthetic environment. So it's like, here, go play in a sandbox. And uh, synthetic environments do have a parent, which is mostly function, but it has, for the most part, its own environment. And then 17% are global, uh, of which they say like the, like basically 17.1% are also implicit and accidental. Like there's 25 explicit global calls, but in the, the ones we have here, it's like some code snippet and so it's an accidental global call. 
maybe it actually doesn't matter so much in this case. Basically, mostly the environment is explicitly specified and then summons package. Okay, so we set function, and one of the wonderful things about R's um, eval is that you can specify how far up the call style you look. Um, so you can say, well, I'm going to go muck around in the variables of my caller or my grand caller, or even like, you know, three or more things up the, uh, up the call stack, right? So you're, that's super weird. Um, we can call it spooky action at a distance. They had something, not quite that, but I'm going to quote Einstein. And so in 3.5% of cases, it's like, hey, you're changing something that's not you and that's not your caller and it's not even your grand caller. And one of the things we can discuss is this statement, modular reasoning is thus impossible in R. All right, so about environments, what they find is, well, eval extends the behavior of functions. And so it reads and writes variables in the functions context, usually, like, you know, the overwhelming majority. Um, because you can look up the call stack, this can break refactoring, which is weird. Um, so yeah, you pull out something in a function in your caller. And so now you're trying to change something two functions up and it doesn't work anymore. It's like WTF. Also often used with synthetic environments like in a sandbox. Okay. And then the last part of this, this part is where does eval wreak havoc and what? So we record non-VM side effects. So they don't care about the VM doing stuff. It's like fine. It's like, where does code that you're, you wrote or that somebody wrote actually change something? So here we have 7.9 million writes recorded from 2.5 million calls, uh, 2418 sites and 1524 functions. And so there is again, this like 90, 10 rule. So 43 functions cause 90% of the side effects and half of them are from three functions. 58% um, of the eval calls update an explicitly given environment. And so here what we have is 39% of the sites and 25% of the functions have an eval which writes to the local environment. So that's kind of the best case. It is modular reasoning, but 6% changes something at offset greater than zero, uh, both sites and functions. And then in a fair number of cases, there's something synthetic or object and then there's actually quite a few multiple. So they write to a bunch of different environments, which is hard to deal with. All right, what is it doing? So sometimes it is an update, sometimes it is a definition of a variable, and a tiny percent of the time it does a removal of a variable, which is kind of sketchy again. All right, so again, you know, all papers are in a conversation of papers that have been written in the past. And so let's compare R to JavaScript. In principle, R eval is more dangerous than JavaScript eval. It can pass in an environment and it can wreak havoc in that environment. However, side effects are actually more common in JavaScript than in R, and over half of them are in a predictable environment. So that's something. And so as the authors put it, it's a ray of hope for a hypothetical R compiler. It's still hard, but you can do something in, in many cases. All right. So the next question is why? Why are people using eval? And so what they did here was a manual inspection of the top 117 sites or the ones in, that account for 90% of the calls. And so I'm not gonna run through it all, but basically there's two main categories for providing better inferences in the library for, for our users and to simplify the implementation. So one and a half examples of better interface. This is weird, man. So it looks like you're calling, you're accessing flights, but it turns out that the left bracket operator is a function call because everything is a function call. And what it's going to do is it's going to eval its args. And so it's, it's this is not normal R syntax, it's modified R syntax and it's saying, please extract all flights with carrier equals delta and year 2014. And, um, extract the mean departure delay and give it by origin, right? Um, so yeah, use eval to allow you to write this kind of R code, which is helpful. It does allow you to not have ugly syntax, I guess, but it's weird. 
And again, as a domain specific language or metaprogramming. So what we have here is the glue function. And so in other languages, you kind of just have this without eval, but in R it's done with eval. And so what it's doing, it's devaluating greeting, which is a variable in the context um, that, that you have here. And so you're, you know, it's, it's doing something that you'd expect that makes sense, right? It's like, you know, printf does this, right? But here it's doing it with eval. The other big category is implementation simplification. And again, it's metaprogramming. Um, code generation. So what we have here is this function that makes C++ methods. Uh, I guess if you don't have eval, another way you do this is you generate a code generator, right? You write code that generates a text file that's code. Uh, but they have eval, so they're going to do this this way, and they're going to make C++ methods in a um, binding generator between C++ and R, right? So they create a bunch of method bindings, basically, by substituting um, things. And also boilerplate removal. So what they're doing here is they're constructing a call to the uh, function stats model frame, right? And so you can see it's getting this call, and then it's like getting some parameters from the call, and then it's creating this thing. All right, so getting to the end. So the overall discussion of R and eval, mostly used for metaprogramming and accessing remote environments. Unlike in JavaScript, it's often hard to rewrite code not to use eval. Um, so they show one example, which I think is on the next slide. Uh, sometimes you can do this. So what can developers do? So you can say, instead of writing this thing where you call eval to eval q and you call eval to call to um, call q.f, what you can instead do is you can use the built-in function get and you can just directly call q.f. Sometimes you can do this. It's hard to find, um, you know, it's hard to find both statically and dynamically. Look, there's like these function arguments and what are these function arguments? Can we get rid of them? Well, you can look at it. If you look at it, it's sort of obvious. If you want to get a, have the compiler look at it, nah, too hard. And they also point out, well, there's eval alternatives which work in some contexts and they're, they're better. So you have lazy and lazy eval and eval tidy. Okay, so their conclusion is in the general case, eval is hell if you're a programming languages person and you're trying to do automated program understanding. So it turns out that also most developers don't use it. However, the code that most developers do write does need eval to work. So it's used in the libraries extensively, like you know, 20% of libraries, which is kind of a small proportion, but it's enough to screw up your, your, your attempt to compile it. And it's mostly used for macro programming. And they said the way forward is special cases and subsets. All right, so that's the summary of their paper. Let's talk a bit about what we think about the paper. So I guess I said this throughout, but it's good to say it once at the end. I think it's a context which has been not so explored in the past, so it's always useful to explore new context, especially context that account for a lot of use of computers in the world. Um, it's a big empirical study, and so that's always, again, brings up the question, well, so what? In this case, the application that they're selling and the application which is easy to sell to the audience of this paper is obviously there should exist good programming languages techniques for this language, and this is a prerequisite. This is an obvious prerequisite for doing it because you have no hope of understanding the program if you don't understand what the program is doing, and it's hard because there's eval, and so how often does it happen? Is it well done? Yes. Um, they capture all the things that I think that you want to capture in a study like this. And so they, they, it's exhaustive and well-motivated. So only rarely do I say, well, are they still like looking at more things? No, I think in general, most of the things that they, um, present are well-motivated and useful in understanding how R works. All right, let's talk about this paper.